still fine for audio, right? I just realized the headphones were a bit much. <laughs> for, <laughs> so I'll switch to this instead. Okay, guys, we're live on YouTube. Uh, Varun, will you tell me when we have a few people and then I'll kick stop, uh, kick start the intro? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I'll switch to this instead. Much. <laughs> You can start, Atika. Okay, sounds good. Um, so, good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us on a Sunday evening. Uh, I'm Artika from Team Agami, an organization that's enabling and catalyzing ideas that serve justice. Uh, just to recap a few thoughts uh, for those joining us for the very first time for these sessions. Um, we're all really here because we realize that this crisis is a historic moment that is going to change the way we see rights, our institutions, for a significant time to come. Uh, in that sense, it's really important to understand that this moment and how we respond to it has to be useful and an opportunity for change ready. So let's not stop at reacting to it, but really get more clarity on the roles that we can play in making access to justice better and easier for everyone. Uh, to that end, the Justice in a Pandemic series began with the first session which really painted the canvas of risks and opportunities for the justice system in India, uh, from prisons to courts, to rights and entitlements of citizens, to accountability of institutions. We explored the length and breadth of the landscape in our first session. Uh, from there, we moved into our next session, which was about a very crucial aspect of courts that is being discussed right now as we speak, in fact, in how can courts embrace going digital? and do it in a way that only, not only just builds more capacity, but also creates newer ones. Um, um, I mean, what is beyond video conferencing? Uh, again, the conversation revealed many actionable <coughs> insights, which we're glad to say that the community that jo joins us for these sessions is taking up and working on. Um, all through the last week, we explored what would it take to build and promote online dispute resolution in the country from the point of businesses, startups, law firms, and more. Um, finding ways to settle disputes online and outside courts is something not only relevant, but I think necessitated by the times that we're in. Uh, the recordings for all these sessions are on YouTube, so do take a look whenever you have the chance. Uh, coming to today, Honestly, uh, I couldn't have imagined going through the lockdown without having access to the internet. Uh, my phone and laptop are what are keeping me sane and connected to the world outside. Uh, I mean, all of us joining this session, it's possible because we have access to the internet. But there are many others who don't have this privilege. So what is access to the internet when it's a right? What is it that we're meant to have? What is it that we don't have? Um, to discuss this and more, we have an incredible panel of experts. We have the Quinn's Associate Editor of Legal, the wonderful Vakasha Sachdev, joining us in the very last moment moderating this discussion. Can't thank him enough. Uh, Anubha Bhosle, who was meant to join us, has unfortunately had a personal emergency, but we do hope to bring her back for a future session. So just that, and last thing, questions, audience, please post it on the YouTube uh, chat box. Somebody from the Agami team will post them on the Zoom feature here for Vakasha to take up as and when. And that's it from me. Vakasha, over to you. Thank you so much, Artika, for that. And uh, welcome, everyone, to this session. Uh, this is, I think, uh, I mean, as, as Artika said, I'm a bit jumping in here at the last minute. So if I do mess up, please, you know, don't judge me too much. Um, I'm going to try and make sure you hear mostly just all the good stuff from all our experts and you don't have to listen to too much waffle from me. Uh, so, uh, as Atika said, our issue, the, the, what we're discussing today is uh, access, internet access as something related to justice, and particularly in a time of a pandemic like this, but also trying to look forward to how those issues of internet access can be taken forward even afterwards. Uh, so, let's just quickly dive into the panelists, because as I said, these are the experts, a, a really, really good panel of people who will all bring you a very, very different set of perspectives on this 
and they're the ones you want to listen to, not me. So uh, to begin with, we have Justice Badar Durez Ahmed, uh, who was former Chief Justice of the JNK High Court. He's been a, a, a judge of the Delhi High Court for 15 years. So, you know, someone who's had a lot of experience uh, actually understanding how issues of j access to justice, whether it's labor, leave alone issues of obviously just do, does a rich person have access to the internet, but a lot of other issues which are going to be very, very key here. The experience which he's had obviously in Jammu and Kashmir will also, as you can imagine, be a very important part of this discussion. Uh, we have Aruna Sundarajan, who uh, she retired as India's telecom secretary and chairman of the telecom commission. Uh, she's uh, from the Kerala Cadre IAS, uh, 1982. She joined in 1998. She set up Kerala's first ever Department of Information Technology. Uh, and you know, under in, in more recent years, she's been a key part of the whole Digital India program as well. So. Um, you know, again, someone who's going to bring a lot of expertise and understanding of how, you know, solutions to this kind of thing actually work on the ground when you're trying to work from the government side. Uh, Apar Gupta uh, is the executive director of the Internet Freedom Foundation. You guys will have seen a lot of their work, a lot of the things which they talk about, uh, which they've been doing a lot of really good adv advocacy, not just in terms of writing research papers about it, but also going and filing cases in court and standing up for important issues and uh, digital rights and privacy. They assess all the things which are going on these days uh, with government policy or even the private sector when it comes to the internet and digital rights. And they're out there keeping a watch for you. Uh, now he's uh, he's a, a long-standing lawyer who uh, has worked on uh, constitutional challenges, including uh, the 66A1 uh, and the right to privacy cases and, and the other. So, uh, and of course, more specifically on the Kashmir shutdown cases at the Supreme Court. Rahul Matan is a very, very experienced lawyer. He's the, he's sort of the, the part, of, I think now heading the TMT practice at Trilegal. He's worked with companies from all sectors of the industry, you know, big telecom uh, operators to, uh, you know, whether it's internet service providers or whether it's the telecom guys. I remember he, even when I used to be a lawyer in London, he'd come to talk to, he was meeting a lot of people there and we met him as part of that. Uh, he's one of the most reputed lawyers on all of this. He's uh, a published author. He writes a weekly column at Mint. Some of you may recently, for instance, have even read his recent column on the Arogya Setu app. Now, uh, just a bit of a disclaimer, we're not gonna get into some of those issues uh, in a lot of detail at the start. We will come to those as we go along. Um, so that's the panel which we have before us uh, today. I'm gonna just take us through a very brief idea of what the structure will be. And then I'm gonna hand over to Rahul to sort of build on this a bit more. So essentially we're looking at three parts to this discussion. The first will be sort of identifying what really do we mean here in terms of uh, internet access and its connection to justice. What do we mean by access to the internet? I mean, is it just any broad based type? Is it access to of any sort of any speed? or does it need to be of a particular kind of access, a particular quality of access to the internet? And then in terms of justice itself, are we only talking about being able to go to the courts in times of crisis, or are we looking at more than that? Is it about uh, educational rights or health rights or uh, things where the internet may play a role even outside of just going and trying to file a case before the court? Uh, this becomes, this is obviously crucial in light of the whole idea of Article 19, uh, you know, the, the right to, whether it's uh, freedom of speech or whether it's freedom to practice your profession, how important is the internet these days in that sphere? Um, we'll then, the second part of the discussion will be on challenges uh, to all of this. What are the sort of things which you have to keep in mind when you're trying to uh, address, you know, what are the, the big problems which have to be addressed when we're looking at access to the internet and uh, justice in the, in the in today's day and age. And obviously you can imagine there's issues from uh, the digital divide and having the right infrastructure to, of course, issues of surveillance and privacy as well. And lastly, we'll try and go over some of the solutions which can be looked at here and how all the different stakeholders can come together to kind of try and not only use this uh, this moment right now to, to, to provide essential services, but also try and set out a roadmap for doing things better in the future. So uh, if I can get Rahul to jump in now with his views on the act, on, you know, when we're talking about access to the internet, how would you define that? And how would you define, uh, and where do you see it playing a role when it comes to the concept of justice? Uh, Rahul, Rahul, you're, Rahul, you're on mute, unfortunately. Okay. I'm a tech lawyer, I'm supposed to get this, but you know, this is, this is what happens. Thank you, uh, Vakasha, thank you. 
inviting me uh, uh, to be part of this panel. Um, I just wanted to start by saying, uh, you know, the the internet. When I when I was a lawyer, there was one computer in the office. It was in the room next to the fax machine, uh, and the only way you could use it was to dial up to another modem in my other office, and literally computers talk to each other. That was the internet when I was a young lawyer. Um, the internet has always been thought of as a luxury. But in the last three or four years, my belief is the internet is a necessity. And you've got to think about this. Uh, the, the, the most telling example of this is when you used to go to hotels long ago, you used to get these bottles of bisleri water, but you had to pay for it. And then maybe about 15 years ago, they made it all free. So you could have unlimited bisleri water. They did the same thing for uh, Wi-Fi in hotels no, no, no earlier than maybe a year or two years ago. Today, so much of what we do is done on the internet. Uh, our payments are done on the internet. Uh, most of the way in which we communicate is done on the internet. Uh, we, uh, uh, yeah, as, uh, as we said, right, as uh, Artika said right at the beginning, if it wasn't for the internet, this pandemic and this lockdown would have been uh, almost unbearable. Um, but still, we feel that when things are difficult, and when I say we, I, I mean the country, I mean many countries around the world feel that when things are difficult, we have the ability uh, to shut down the internet uh, to prevent communications from happening, to prevent uh, certain types of uh, inter uh, uh, intercourse between people. And I believe that if the past three or four years haven't demonstrated it well enough, that this pandemic will demonstrate that the internet uh, has got to become elevated uh, to the status of a right. Uh, it's got to reach the point where we don't anymore have the option to switch it off uh, because we find it inconvenient or we find that if the internet is still on, uh, that the, uh, the internet is going to uh, allow bad people to communicate with each other uh, and we should, we should not, uh, uh, we, sh we should have the ability to switch it off. When these sorts of things happen, we don't switch electricity off. When these sorts of things happen, we don't switch the water supply off. The internet in my mind is uh, as essential a commodity today's day and age uh, and our modern societies. I mind if I start uh, this debate. Uh, you mentioned um, a few other points, which I think maybe we'll, we'll get into uh, at a at a later point in time. Um, just, a, uh, just a quick thing, uh, Rahul, we're, we're losing you a bit in between. Um, are you using a Wi-Fi thing or are you using a mobile uh, data? Is there any other option which you might have to try and... Because we keep losing uh, you a little bit in between. Okay. Do you want to move to someone else? Let me see what I can set up separately. Uh, because yeah, we, we just lost, I think pretty much the last, we were, you just been talking about that why, you know, we don't uh, switch off electricity. We don't switch off waters after I got very patchy. So we weren't able to, so I think. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's better. Okay. Um, so yeah, so, so the, the point I was trying to make was that as long as uh, the internet is treated as a luxury, uh, we're going to feel that we can switch off uh, the internet whenever it's, it's not convenient for us. Uh, but if we can elevate the internet uh, to a necessity, uh, we will start using, uh, start being a little more uh, uh, chary about when we switch it off. Um, and I think the time has come. Uh, and if the, if, if the previous few years did indicate it, the, uh, the current pandemic will uh, indicate it, I hope, very clearly. Uh, that you absolutely need the internet uh, for various things. Some of the other things you mentioned um, were around, you know, what is uh, internet in terms of what is the bandwidth, what is the nature of the connectivity. I think those are uh, issues of degree that we can go into. Um, we have challenges as far as uh, rolling out infrastructure is concerned that, you know, we've got Aruna Sundarajan who know one better uh, to explain uh, those issues. Uh, but certainly the, the ability to connect uh, using the internet has reached the level where I think we've got to recognize that it is, uh, if not a right, it is a necessity. And I would very much like for it to be a right as well. Okay. 
That is, uh, that's a good way to start. I, th I think um, one of the interesting aspects is here, uh, as Rahul talked about, the issue is that, you know, we still see it as a luxury, not as an essential thing, not as a right. Uh, one of the interesting uh, developments of late was that, uh, I don't know if people remember that when the, the UK was having its recent general election, there was actually a whole proposal by the Labour Party there where they were advocating internet essentially as an essential now in the same way that you had electrification of countries back, you know, 100 years ago, they were saying the same thing needs to be done for the access to the internet. And they were trying to launch that as one of their manifesto promises, which obviously did quite work out. Um, but I think that's a key issue to look at here is how we assess, how what do we look at the internet as? Is it purely uh, something which it's it's nice to have, or is government and is policy making uh, sort of looking at it as an actual essential right? So I think uh, the, a national you know uh, jumping off point here will be to uh, Aruna Sundarajan. Uh, uh, Aruna, ma'am, this issue of how are we viewing the uh, internet? Should it be viewed as a right, as a necessity, or is it still being viewed as a luxury? How is that process really working? when it comes to decision-making in government. Uh, Ma'am, you're on mute. If you could just unmute the thing, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear now. Okay, uh, thanks. I'm um, delighted to be here. Uh, at the outset, I couldn't agree more with the initial points flagged by Rahul. Uh, because I think what we have seen steadily in recent uh, years and months is that the internet has absolutely moved uh, from being a utility that is, I mean, from being a luxury that a few people are using to a very basic utility. And, uh, you know, when I was telecom secretary, I was struck by the fact that uh, you know, at the numbers of common people who were basically transacting their whole livelihoods and their whole lives on the internet. Uh, while saying that, I must concede that we do have the issue of digital divide. Uh, we probably have only 50% of Indians who have access to, you know, fairly meaningful uh, internet. Uh, and so the first thing is that this pandemic has brought home to us that if we did not need internet in the past, we absolutely do need it now. So I think we all need to see how is it that we can actually get internet to people out there. Now, this brings me to an interesting point. You know, when the government first declared the lockdown on March 25th, and then they brought out the first set of orders I think late evening of March 25th or March 26th, I don't recollect the exact date. I was struck by the fact that there was hardly any mention of telecom there. And so I, you know, the first thing that struck me was forget about the movement of essential goods and services. You first of all need to have access to communications and access to the net because all these migrants and you know, millions of people who are stranded in different places, the first thing they're going to try is to either book themselves a you know, seat home, buy themselves a ticket, pay for some service. So I think that point, I, I don't want to labor the point, uh, your question about how is government viewing this? How should government be viewing this? And I want to say that uh, in my estimation, I don't think government has as yet realized how critical this infrastructure is. In fact, uh, I served on the task force, the COVID task force uh, in Kerala. And the first thing was we devoted a whole chapter to seeing how we would ensure that the internet services would not get disrupted how there would be a 30 to 40% increase in the availability of the internet. Uh, in fact, we had put in suggestions to see that people who normally don't have access to the net somehow need to be given access because they're the people who need it the most. Uh, so I think uh, even in this hour of pandemic, while we all 
uh, at one level recognize that the internet has become indispensable, uh, we still do not have adequate attention of the decision makers. So the first point is I would call their attention to making sure that they get the internet, quality internet to everybody out there. I do want to, at a later point, uh, if you, uh, you know, think it's appropriate, want to speak about what kind of internet, because I think uh, it is also important to know uh, that, that we need to have access to free flow of information on the net. And this is not the time when we need to be thinking in terms of imposing controls so that we get only partial information. But I think that's a point which we can take up later on. Uh, actually, I mean, if you if if you would like to sort of just give a few uh, a brief structure of what you are looking at there in terms of uh, what kind of internet, because we can then get others to also sort of because that comes into I think the broader framing of the issue as well. Like uh, as I was saying at the start, are we looking at just having a and because this is particularly part of one of the key issues which you can which we will come to soon, which is the Kashmir issue. So I thought it was going to it would be helpful to sort of get your view at this stage itself. You can if you could yeah. just. Uh, so uh, I think, give us an outline of what you mean by that. Yeah, so two key uh, issues that come up immediately when we consider this issue is that we still have uh, in the whole state of Jammu and Kashmir, uh, only landlines have access to normal internet. And as you know, on the mobile, we, people are only uh, having 2G and that too, it is only the post-paid SIMs for prepaid holders of mobile, they still have to get verified. And so we know that there is one state of the Indian Union. We've also seen that as late as April 16th, you know, uh, April 15th, petitions have been filed pointing out what is the kind of severe hardship that people in that state are facing. Healthcare experts don't have access to the internet. Forget anybody else. Uh, school children, since they can't go to school, they don't have uh, access to normal education. And I mean, there's extensive documentation that's already been done. So that is one si type of blocking of the internet. And we know that India, you know, in recent times, we have resorted to uh, bans on the internet uh, in various places. That's one. The second thing is that, uh, you know, the central government had approached the Supreme Court uh, in the end of March, saying that uh, in view of the large proliferation of fake news, etc., any news before it is put out, it must be verified with the mechanism available in the government of India, the official mechanism. Fortunately, I think the Supreme Court, uh, you know, in its wisdom, did not issue any such uh, order, but said that you know, let there be access to information and let there be a voluntary court. So I think that was very salutary. And the third thing we're saying, seeing is that even during uh, this time, uh, that a lot of instances of freedom of speech, etc., cetera, uh, have come under, uh, you know, severe action uh, by various state governments. So all of that uh, in some way is threatening and undermining freedom of expression, which is a you know, essential aspect of rights and justice. So I think this is also then offers us a chance to, to bring Justice Ahmed in on this. Now, Justice Ahmed, when you were at the uh, Kashmir uh, High Court, was this issue of the, I mean, the, the issue of the interbans, was this something the judges ever really thought about? Because even, I mean, a lot of cases were not often filed against uh, these internet shutdowns, but was there something, I mean, as a, as a judge, when you're looking at this kind of development happening and someone who obviously has all the expertise when it comes to constitutional issues and what the, you know, the, what the rights under Article 19 really are, wh how, what was the view taken by you in terms of these, these kind of, these internet shutdowns and how does that, and, and should the considerations which could even justify that in regular times continue to apply in a time like this when access to information is so crucial. Because as you know, as, as uh, Arun has pointed out, we still have uh, restrictions on mobile internet in Jammu and Kashmir. It's still only at 2G speeds, which makes it very, very difficult. See, I have always been a votary of uh, e-courts. And uh, obviously when you, have, when you talk about e-courts, you talk about internet access and access to justice through the internet. 
And uh, in fact, while I was in the Delhi High Court, we started the pilot project in 2009-10 when we established the first e-court where uh, the court was completely paperless. Uh, taking this back to Kashmir, you see, when I was Chief Justice in Kashmir, the, the internet lockdowns were lasting for probably a day or two days, or maximum for about five days. And that too, on particular, uh, when there were uh, strikes of militancy, etc., which were happening at that uh, sporadically. It was not a lockdown like the one that we have experienced in the last one year, where complete shutdown has taken place. And... Uh, Insofar as uh, Jammu and Kashmir is concerned, at that point of time, it was one state. Now, of course, it has been bifurcated into uh, two union territories. But the High Court remains the same. The High Court still looks after Jammu, Kashmir and uh, Ladakh. Now, one of the problems that we were facing while we were in Jammu and Kashmir was that people from Ladakh used to have a great difficulty in having their cases heard in either Jammu or in Kashmir, which were the two places where the uh, high court benches were sitting. So what, I, what we had decided at that time was that why can't we hear those people, the lawyers and the litigants, why can't they access their cases which are being heard uh, concerning lay and uh, other areas in Ladakh through video conferencing. And so we started that project and it was uh, 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 welcomed like anything. Now the question is that when you have uh, uh, places which are far flung and when you have people who want to reach the court how do they reach it they reach it either physically or they reach it through electronic means which are available today and for that you must have the internet and if you don't have internet access how do you access justice so that is one of very important feature that uh, we have to keep in mind that internet access is is a part of access to justice it is, as, as uh, the earlier speakers pointed out, it is not just a luxury, but it is a necessity. Now, there are serious problems with regarding how we can uh, uh, provide this access to justice to the internet. One of them, of course, is the fact that many people in India don't have access to the internet. So if they don't have access to internet, in other words, they don't have access to justice also. And that is a huge problem. Now, how do you have access to internet is obviously either through computers or uh, Wi-Fi connectivity or through 4G or, and in some places, 2G connectivity. So you must empower the people to have that access. One solution, of course, can be, and if we are ready to discuss solutions now and not leave it for later, one solution can, of course, be that every state has a legal services authority. I, I don't know whether the panelists and the other people who are listening to it know about it, but every state has a legal services authority, which is a statutory body and is directly under the control of the high court and the Supreme Court. Now, these legal service authorities have district uh, legal service authorities. And of course, then they spread out into the various talukas and smaller areas. And each of them have internet access. So the legal services authorities can play a tremendous role in providing access to the internet and through that to the courts and therefore give access to justice to the, to the people all over the country. I mean, there is a legal service authority in every district in India. Just like you have a district magistrate, you have a, 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 the district judge who is heading the district legal services authority and he has access to the internet. So if a particular village or some uh, uh, small town falling in that district doesn't have access, they, the lawyers can, uh, through the legal services authority or even through the district courts, have access to internet, which is available and connected to the uh, various high courts and even the Supreme Court. So that is one aspect. But for that, the infrastructure has to be improved. Because even now, as we are seeing, we are talking over Zoom, but we are still having uh, missing audio and we are still having uh, video which is jerky and although I have a 350 Mbps connection but maybe the others don't so you see unless and until we bring it up to a particular level access to justice through the internet will still re uh, remain as as an illusion I can't hear you 
So we're going to, um, I think now, uh, get uh, a part to quickly weigh in on uh, some of these issues. And then after that, we're going to take some of the questions which are coming through. Uh, so a part, uh, what I was hoping uh, to get from you now is because as you now, I, 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 want, I want to know, we are, we have, we, we've obviously got this, this very clear idea that there is a need for the internet to be recognized as an essential. But you know, which is that, that as as Arunas pointed, that's still not something which the governments are quite ready to do yet. So how do we kind of try to improve and make people understand that this is something of that level? And what are the and how do we start addressing some of these challenges? As I think everyone's pointed out here, the question of the digital divide. Uh, just as Emma's given us one possible way to uh, address that. But again, that's to the extent that if you're trying to get people access to the courts, that's one way to do it. What are the other ways in which we need to kind of try to ensure that these kind of problems, uh, whether it's digital divide or others, are addressed? And, and what are the issues which have to which we have to be mindful about when we're thinking of taking this forward as well? Uh, thank you so much, Vakasha, uh, for that generous intro introduction in, uh, earlier. And thank you uh, to the team Agami also for organizing this. Very quickly, if you're walking towards solutions, I think uh, a lot will be revealed by uh, studying the numbers which are put out in the quarterly performance reports uh, which uh, of the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, which show uh, continuous uh, data side trends in terms of aggregate numbers on connectivity, both in urban as well as rural places. So I think it's a price sensitive issue, firstly, in terms of growth of access, because most people do uh, prevail, uh, avail access to private uh, telecom companies who also act as internet service providers. That's the first point to consider. The second is why BSNL is there and the BharatNet initiative is there. Last mile is where I think uh, it indicates repeated problems. And the second is that there's a contrast between urban areas and rural areas. When urban areas for 100 people, you may have 124 connections, but in rural areas, it drops much more considerably lower. So at the end, what we have seen is out of about 100 people in India, there are about 54 active connections and one person may be having multiple connections. So I think more work needs to be done to, in fact, broad-based access by state governments as well as other public authorities providing it. As Justice Ahmed stated, if um, access uh, to courts or to justice is to a large degree being fulfilled by the internet. There may be authorities associated with that public institution, such as the legal services authority of a state, which may act as an enabling intermediary to facilitate that access. That is one way to do it. So other state functions can also, for instance, if you're looking at certain government offices, may also provide it in a way in which people can avail it without uh, building that independent infrastructure for that person to own a smartphone and to access the internet. Just in terms of the right and some elements of conversation which occurred there, uh, in terms of the Anuradha Basin judgment, which was the Kashmir shutdowns judgment, that was a progressive judgment by the court, though it did fall short. And I think it's also reflected in government policy. For instance, the TRI explanatory memorandum, which accompanied the prohibition on zero rated services, also cites how the in access to the internet is a core necessity. So I think there is broad recognition both within the judiciary as well as the executive branches of government that the access to the internet is a right. But is it a practice reality is something else and how deeply it is being considered is also an issue. Now, specifically to Arunaji's point, and this is where I'll end, is with regard to COVID. Because uh, I think a large part of the analysis which arises today is due to the space we are in right now in which we are talking to each other just over this call remotely over different cities, giving the utility of the internet and high quality internet uh, uh, a very tangible value. So I think um, there are three steps which are necessary at today's point in time by the Department of Telecom. This is contained even in a uh, letter which was sent by the Internet Freedom Foundation on March 18, 2020 to both the Department of Telecom and TRAI. The first is for periodic reviews of existing telecom infrastructure, focusing on the last mile. Is it adequate? Is it holding up? And this can be done in a multi-stakeholder body or even an ad hoc system in which there are telecom companies and their content 
big content providers and also some consumer side voices, academics and experts there. The second is to encourage voluntary pledges by telecom companies, given that there is a huge amount of economic stress being faced by people, people and they may not be able to top up their internet connections or may not be able to pay it on a continual basis. So the Federal Communications Commission in the United States has actually encouraged voluntary pledges by ISPs not to disconnect people during these times of a lockdown, which is in force in certain states in the United States. We may be able to do that. That's a voluntary pledge, which may be encouraged given the necessity of remaining connected today. And finally, is to ensure full and complete access at all times to the internet. And this is for an advisory to the state governments to halt internet shutdowns during this time till we can um, review the underlying regulatory system for internet shutdowns by itself. And at the very least limit how they are uh, put into place, if not completely abating this practice altogether. So with this, Vakasha, I'll just stop. So uh, what we, one of the things which we've got, I think, so let's pick up some of these questions now. And there's a few common themes which we're seeing coming across in the questions. So let's try picking those up uh, as much as we can. Uh, so there's a set of questions which uh, I was looking, we can try to talk about here are legally the right, as everyone's saying here, it's an essential thing to have. Everyone should have access to the internet. But as of now, we still don't quite have an acknowledgement of the internet as a fundamental right from the courts. Or do we? So I think that's that's one stage, to, one thing to clarify. One, A, is that what, what is the, the sort of legal standing at this point? Two, if it's not, how do we sort of get it to reach that point? And three, is how do you then ensure that there are sort of safeguards to it? Because it's uh, at the end of the day, the way uh, false information can be spread, uh, as some of you may have seen, the way there was that whole crisis at the Bandra terminus in Mumbai. Now that kind of information is there. Is there any? Should we? How much do we need to be thinking about those kind of things when considering it as a right and the kind of restrictions which would go on it? So I'm going to start with uh, Justice Ahmed here. Uh, do you see the courts? acknowledging already at this point that the that, that access to internet is a fundamental right or do you think because kerala high court did it the supreme court didn't quite go there they said it was that access to the internet was crucial for aspects of freedom of profession uh, and freedom of speech but it, it or do you think that that is strong enough and what are the other steps which are needed to start making that a reality on the ground see insofar as what the supreme court has said i think uh, it has said that the uh, internet is the vehicle for freedom of speech and expression as also for occupation and business, which, is, which means that uh, the uh, right to internet is embedded in the in Article 19 itself. So it's not anything separate from being a fundamental right insofar as that's my view. And that's how we should look at it and we should take it on, take it further from there. Now the question is, as uh, Apar said, that how does it play out practically? That is the more important question. Theoretically, yes, it is there. The Supreme Court judgment is excellent on theory, but how, how does it, uh, what is the consequence of that? How is the government playing it out? That needs to be checked. And how are the courts then responding to any action taken by the government or by the citizen? That, that is what it needs to be seen. And that, that hasn't become a clear picture as yet. That is one problem. And uh, insofar as uh, the internet itself is concerned, it is, it, I, I mean, people must look at it as a highway or a road. Now, if there are some robber, highway robberies or some people who are robbing the, in the, uh, the miscreants on the road, you don't shut down the road. You allow people to go through that road because that is, that is, uh, that is the connect, connection between uh, one citizen, another citizen, one town, another town, one city, another city. And uh, in fact, internet now has become the lifeblood of commerce. Not only commerce, it's become the lifeblood of education. And it has become the lifeblood of healthcare. And therefore, uh, one has to look at it very critically and uh, specifically in the light of the guidelines given by the Supreme Court, which I think are outstanding in that sense. But you must follow it to the T. And you must carry out the action to the T so that whatever is said in theory is accepted in practice. Now, insofar as fake news is concerned, that also people say is a part of freedom of speech and expression. But of course, people may express their viewpoints, 
but question is when you misrepresent a fact what what happens because of that according to me there are enough provisions under the indian penal code which can take care of that what people need to do is register uh, their complaints if the fir's are not registered send it by by registered post if they are still not accepted by registered post go to the magistrate and have your fir registered people must take action which is already available under the law and then it is for the courts to react and of course uh, there is one court there is a higher level there is a higher level ultimately whatever is said by the supreme court is the law of the land we have to uh, we have to take what it says but we must people must continue to keep trying through the ju judicial methods that are available thank you so much as samad um so i'm going to pick another question now which i think uh, Uh, Rahul, would you like to sort of join uh, address? There's a query about so one is what can India learn from other countries on the right to internet and how it can be employed during a and especially in terms of how that can be employed during a period like this. And um, I think I would also like to, there's another question which we've got here about uh, is it just about ensuring access to the it access to the internet or does civil society have to play a, a greater role in then also making sure that it is uh, followed up and it is something which people are able to truly understand it's about it's should it just be the state or should civil society also be involved with that discussion so rahul would you like to weigh in on those two questions sure and and uh, let let me try and um, uh, answer answer your questions but perhaps in a slightly different way so you know i think just giving uh, internet access is not going to be enough because we know that uh, there is a certain basic threshold of access that we need today in order for the Uh, for that access to be effective, we've got to have. I mean, if you're doing a payment transaction, you need a very low uh, bandwidth. But if you're doing anything else, you're going to need uh, higher bandwidth connections. And there's a certain basic minimum that internationally people recognize as broadband. Uh, and so, rather than talk about the right uh, to the internet, which I think is something that is easy to guarantee, uh, we may have reached the point where we are talking about the right to broadband internet. And th and the reason I mention that is because. communication such as this particularly in a crisis is very critical uh, you you may need to have video throughput levels uh, as far as the bandwidth is concerned in order uh, for uh, the internet in a, in a pandemic to be uh, to be useful um and so i you know i think that, that that's the fine point we've got to make because it's easy for the state to tick the box saying that i've achieved that uh, that requirement to provide the internet but that's not an effective uh, internet uh, for for a lot of the purposes um i i wanted to pick up this this other point uh, and i and i've read the question as well as to uh, you know what uh, civil society and the government can do uh, and this is also you know part of the themes that have been coming up from the other speakers as well around uh, the fact that you know if you open up the internet uh, there's all sorts of filth that comes on the internet there's fake news there's uh, it's difficult uh, for people to to really understand uh, what is right and what is wrong in all of this news that they're getting uh some of which seems uh, to be you know absolutely legitimate but you find out that it's completely fake um and i you know i really like the way just as amit uh, put it and i and that's sort of been part of my core philosophy about this as well uh, is that if uh, if you know there, there is a crime that's conducted on a road you don't shut roads down uh if the railways uh, if there's a spate of dacoities on railways you don't shut the railways down to stop the dacoities you actually have to focus on the bad elements who are committing these offenses on these pipes of communication and you have to crack down on them uh fake news has been with us for centuries fake news has been with us since the romans they've been with us uh you know chanakya was the, the most famous indian minister who used fake news for his advantage machiavelli did it and it has been with us through all forms of technology so we've never shut the technology down in order to address the problem of fake news uh we've got to learn to let the communication channel flow um whether civil society gets involved whether the state gets involved i think uh the uh the approach to fake news has got to be an approach that does not involve shutting the internet down because if as we've all established the internet is a pipe we've got to allow the pipe uh, to function and stay open such that things can flow through it So as you might, uh, so just just to quickly weigh in here, uh, uh, we've been taking, we've been sort of creating questions with some of the people who've been really helpful with putting through, with giving, with uh, adding a lot of questions about this. Uh, whether it's been, uh, uh, we, we've had questions on this uh, on the question of it being a fundamental right by Yashvi Sanghani. 
uh, we've had, um, sorry, please, no. <laughs> as always, technology fails one. We've had Sanjay Zorika uh, adding in questions. Uh, we've had um, questions from, um, uh, from uh, Shivam Malik. Uh, so thank you for everyone who's sort of being involved with this discussion and, and keep sending through the questions. We're gonna try getting as many of them answered as we can. Uh, I have a, a couple of questions here for, uh, for Arunam uh, at this point. So we have, so there's two questions. One is by Ria Chopra. And then there is also another question here by uh, Retupan Joshi. Now, what I want to try and understand here is that I think everyone's identified the digital divide as one of the issues which there is, but how do you try and address this from the state's point of view? Do you try to take the burden on state and PSUs, do you try making sure BSNL is able to do the whole thing everywhere across the country? Or do you try to bring in the private sector and get them involved? And what are the challenges which come in here? Because obviously this issue of digital divide is going to be a huge problem. Whether we look at it now, whether we, we say something like 500 million people in India, let's say have internet access, what happens to all the others who don't have it on an easy basis? Uh, what happens to the people who don't have a great connection? So what are the ways in which the government and the state can try to get involved here? And, and should they be trying to involve the private sector to a large extent in this? Uh, yeah, so absolutely. Because as you know, in India, uh, you know, the growth of telecom connections from around 30 million in the early 90s to where we are, 1.35 billion, that has been driven you know, almost exclusively by the private sector in the sense that of course, BSNL and MTNL have done their bit, but the bulk of the growth uh, has come from the private sector. And the entire telecom sector today, if you look at, uh, you know, the role that the private sector plays, it is an absolutely predominant role. Uh, what does India need to do? I think, uh, it's been doing pretty well in recent years, except for the last two, year, two, three years when the telecom sector has been under stress. But otherwise, if you see every year they were adding on, you know, huge capacity. The point is that the unfinished agenda in the telecom sector, which is that you need to have a, a state of the art 4G network covering every part of the country that needs to be completed on priority. Similarly, the Bharat Net project, which was meant to bring fiber optic cables to 250,000 gram panchayats in the country, that needs to be completed on priority. And although those are not things that government can do uh, in a very short term, the point is there are lots of things which governments have been doing. The first thing is, we know that network capacities have gotten so stressed. We've heard the telcos say a few days back that you know, there's been a 25% drop in performance because uh, you know, everybody is using the net. Rural, uh, we have heard that there's been a 100% increase in data consumption. So the point is that many countries have done lots of things. If you look at the US, for example, they have uh, earmarked almost 300 million US dollars at this time. One, specifically for telemedicine kind of applications. And second, to ensure that those who cannot afford the internet are able to actually afford it by subsidizing them. Similarly, countries like uh, you know, Argentina, Chile, uh, many countries in Africa, Egypt, for example, gave away free SIM cards uh, to students at this uh, time. So I think government needs to intervene both on the demand side and the supply side. On the supply side, if people need more spectrum, if the telcos need more spectrum, if they need double quick rights of way permissions, I think they should give it because this is an essential infrastructure. Second, on the demand side for people who cannot afford smartphones, who cannot afford SIM cards at this point in time, I think government needs to chip in. It's all very well to say that the private sector should do its bit. You know, already we've seen that uh, many of the private sector telcos have said they will allow prepaid cards to be extended even if people have not paid. But I think this is the time for government uh, to step up and see that 
there is support both on the infrastructure side to the telcos and on the uh, you know make it accessible and affordable to the consumers perfect thank you so much aruna um i think that addresses a lot of those queries uh, apart i'm going to now bring you back to answer a, a few other points so these are also so there's a question from uh, let india breathe um, on uh, which has come through on youtube which is about which is asking about surveillance and i want to bring bring you in on this in terms of a continuing what is the role uh, the government uh, what are the things the government should be doing right now about ensuring internet access and what are the ways in which that has to be protected what are the concerns which also have to ensure that we that when we are trying to bring in all of these things right now we don't open a pandora's box here basically uh, or is that something which you know is not a question for this time right now should we instead just be looking at whatever uh, measures can come into to, which which will be beneficial and then look at assessing them afterwards so could you would you like to jump in on that on that question here so i think while a surveillance is a completely uh a uh, a uh, substantive topic in itself bahasha uh, just in terms of high points given that this is the question you've chosen for me um i will just say that in 1995 the supreme court through the people's union for civil liberties judgment uh considered uh the legality of interception which was occurring at that time without a specified uh, process and in the absence of a process or a procedure which was laid down under the telegraph rules it stated that the practice of surveillance wouldn't be controlled so these safeguards were laid down at a time when people were using uh, landline telephones and that too in a very restricted way because getting a landline telephone also at that time wasn't the easiest thing to do uh, now that you have uh, uh, telecom connections and the uh, the internet firstly the kind of information which is flowing through the pipes the volume of it which is incessantly being gathered as well as number of people who are uh, uh, basically uh, uh, putting the most intimate uh, details about them uh, through digital technologies a lot of these safeguards do require to be uh, looked at again and um these are there are, there are uh, there are a batch of petitions pending in the supreme court to do that and uh, this includes the people's union for civil liberties the original petitioner i am representing them in my capacity as a counsel and uh, it also includes the internet freedom foundation uh, which is another petitioner being uh, represented by another legal team and i'll just stop here because these are pending matters and people can look up their pleadings i wouldn't like to make that case on today's call okay so uh, uh, the way i want to sort of wrap this up is uh, i i want everyone to sort of give two ideas which they think are ways in which we can ensure access to justice and here uh, answer specifically relating to uh the, uh the sort of ensuring access to the justice system as well will also be useful as well as general ideas uh which, which would be important for justice i think one of the important themes which has come across from all of this is that it's not just about can you go to court it's about so many other aspects of our lives which are now uh, governed by the internet and where that access is important so if i can get two ideas from everyone so i'll start with uh with rahul here uh would you like to give us say sort of two things which you think uh should be done in 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 at this very time and 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 if those things are things which can continue uh, beyond this pandemic as well okay so um look I, i mean i've been extremely impressed by the way uh, the courts have adapted uh, to this crisis um i you know i i would never have thought that we would be doing uh, cases even though you know it's not the entire cause list but uh, it was extremely heartening to see uh judges uh, and uh lawyers uh, arguing the case out um not face to face but using i don't know if it's a zoom call or i believe it's a video call or something like that but it was extremely heartening to see um and you know i sincerely hope that that's something that continues because uh in and uh, you know even if it even if we do eventually get uh, the uh, lawyers back into the courtroom with the judges just the potential for uh, the entire country to watch justice being done uh, using this technology is is phenomenal uh, it will demystify everything that goes on in court uh, and of course there are times when you can say look this is in camera or you can you, you can have different rules but 
uh, I really found that to be one of the one of the high points for me. And quite frankly, hats off to the to the judicial system um, and the various courts for adapting so quickly. Um, you know, they've brought in things like relaxation of the of the limitation periods and things like that. You know, these are not things that you plan for. Uh, it, this is this this is a good judicial system actually looking at the problem and trying to find solve things for litigants. So that's the one thing which I think uh, I hope will continue. Uh, the other thing, and you know, I don't think it's happening um, really uh, at this time because people are so stressed with uh, with being locked in and things like that. But um, the judicial system is not only courts; it's not only the litigations uh, that uh, Apar fights before Justice Ahmed. The, the, that is, I would say, the top one percent of the judicial system. There is so much other dis there's so many other disputes, so many other things that perhaps companies uh, that are my clients. They leave money on the table because they're like, look, I don't want to deal with a hassle of going to court, but it is still a dispute. And if we can use the online mechanism to actually bring some of those disputes, and, and uh, Agami, I know you're going to thank me for this later. I'm going to plug the ODR uh, mechanism that uh, you guys have been working on. But online dispute resolution, surely the time has come. Uh, and if we can see that we can uh, fight big litigation uh, in the Supreme Court online, I don't see why we can't use online dispute resolution uh, in a more sustained manner uh, to fight some of the, the the many many small disputes where you know litigants of both sides, both the plaintiffs and the defendants, don't think it's worth the while to go through the proper legal system. But if we can offer them an online alternative that actually makes sense um, and and is sort of workable, uh, I sincerely hope that uh, we have the courage to do something like that at the end of this. Right. Um, Justice Ahmed, uh, you had already talked a bit about how the legal service, local legal services authorities could be leveraged to actually ensure people have access to justice, even where they don't themselves have access to the internet, they can still get access to that, uh, to the justice system. Uh, do you have any other suggestion, any other suggestion which you have for s a solution to trying to improve access to the internet and access to justice for people during this time, uh, and particularly something which can go forward as well? Yeah. Uh, one very important thing has happened and uh, the, this pandemic has uh, hastened the process of courts taking to the internet and something which would have taken us four or five years has happened overnight almost in the Supreme Court at least and uh, in several other high courts. So while, while we are all fighting with this uh, dreaded virus, we also see a, a tremendous opportunity because uh, a large number of the judges and of the senior lawyers who were uh, averse to uh, technology and internet and arguing uh, through the video conferencing mode have suddenly been thrown into the, to the so to say the deep end and they find that it is it's not so difficult at all so that is one uh, tremendous plus point which has come out of this and we must not leave it at this we must carry it forward and there is a complete, uh, of course, the time is too short to spell out the entire proposal, but there is a complete proposal of having a completely online paperless uh, court system, which is live streamed uh, to, uh, so that all the people or the litigants, the general public, because after all, a court is supposed to be an open public hearing. So instead of just being restricted to the courtroom, you are actually going to the whole, whole of the country, of, in fact, the whole of the world. That is one aspect of it. The other aspect is, as uh, pointed out by the other panelists, was that uh, apart from the court system, there are other legal disputes which are taking place. For example, I am an arbitrator now, and we are, I, I am hearing many cases through a, through video conferencing. But one of the problems is that the witness is somewhere, the lawyer is somewhere else, the the client is somewhere else. So insofar as trial work is concerned, there seem to be some sort of a con constraint, not insofar as the arbitrator is concerned, but insofar as the lawyers are concerned. And uh, that needs to be worked out. And of course, for that, we need, uh, again, the infrastructure, the high bandwidth. So that is one another area. And of course, mediation, which can be done online in many of the commercial cases. I don't suggest mediation online for personal cases like family disputes and all which have to be resolved on a face-to-face -face basis where people are across the table and they see each other and they talk to each other 
those disputes of course are uh, different and they need to be resolved on a face to face basis and not on online but there are so many other commercial disputes between companies between uh, a lender and a borrower which can be sorted out online so uh, these are avenues which can be taken up and if people have uh, limitations to access to justice they can have uh, you can set up hubs in various towns various cities where uh, which are just centers to give access to justice people can go uh, and log in from there which has high bandwidth connectivity and uh, they can access justice so that is something which the which the government needs to pay attention to and focus on so i think the, so, so that's two common themes have come across from there in terms of access on like actual disputes in court and one of the great side effects which you can see coming from this would be that if a lot of these things are moved to these kind of online fora you might actually see it easier for other people uh, who don't have that access to maybe even get easier access at the courts because of a bit of an unclogging of the system uh, aruna i'm going to bring you in here to give us a few ideas apart from the courts in terms of what can be done and where you see access to the internet playing a role in ensuring justice outside of the courts in terms of other ways so two solutions that you think can sort of come into play here from uh, whether it's from the state or from others and how that could help ensuring access not just going to the courts but other forms of justice as well okay the first uh, response that i have uh, is that you know covid we all you know keep saying is a watershed it's really going to change our lives immeasurably and so there's going to be definitely two worlds an online world and an offline world and we all know that the offline world is going to be so far marginalized that uh you know to speak meaningfully of any kind of justice to people who are in an offline world uh i really don't know what kind of justice we can give them unless you bring those people online how are they going to lead a normal life in future when they can participate in an economic and social and political activity when they can interact with their uh, fellow uh, human beings where they can transact uh, any aspect of their life do we really believe that any of this is going to be possible uh, in an offline world in the way in which it was earlier obviously not uh we know for a fact that for the next 12 to 24 months to begin with you know we are going to be having restrictions of some kind and so what we have already seen in just the last 3 weeks is going to be so far accelerated that the shift to online is going to only accelerate and get more exponential so the first thing i would say is that every country if they want to give justice to all their citizens and especially to those citizens who need uh you know it most because they are the most marginalized then we have to find out how to get internet access out there and for that as i said you know even if you were to enact a right saying that you know internet access is a legal right that's only a legal right it doesn't become a functional right you really have there's no substitute to going out there building the infrastructure and recognizing that this is a basic utility that every person must have so government needs to do that first i would believe that it is entirely possible within the next 6 months to actually ensure that 100% of india is covered by a 4g network if not 6 months within one year we must do that and the second thing i would like to see is i think we need to enact the data protection law sooner rather than later because uh you know as the world gets increasingly digitized i think uh this trade off between uh, privacy and uh you know uh, the uh, security and other concerns this is going to again uh, become an increasing uh, trade off that we will have to be challenged with and therefore the sooner we have uh, a data protection law which is based on wide consultation which has uh, you know a fair degree of consensus amongst india's uh, civil society 
uh, and the public. I think that is what is the need of the hour. So I take it from that that we have to expand, we have to ramp up things, and at the same time to ensure that. that but it cannot. This cannot be done without thinking about data protection and the other yes. issues of privacy and surveillance. So you know, it's and and in fact, by doing that, you might actually even help spur. Uh, taking things forward, whether it comes to the way the regulators will see it, whether it's the way TRII will see it, or whether it will be the way the private telecom sector, they will ensure that their innovations are also based around that. So I would uh, believe so. So we, uh, we're, we've kind of just gone a little bit over time, so I'm going to have to rush apart a little bit here. Uh, your last two solutions, uh, which you think should be done A right now or B taking forward as well. So very quickly, I'm going to have to ask you to quickly go through those so that we can, we can end at this point. So thanks for Kasha. I'll actually uh, state three solutions in about two minutes because I'm actually stealing them from others who have already stated them. I just want to reaffirm their value. Uh, I think the data protection uh, uh, legislation is a very core part of ensuring the political quality of our security also from a cyber security perspective as people go online. Uh, technologies and solutions will then build around much more ethical framework in which people are ultimately in control. It should also be also seen with state surveillance reform in which the government's power also to exercise surveillance is done in a fair and a reasonable manner. The second solution is with regard to uh, the network neutrality enforcement mechanism, which is much beyond network neutrality and also picks up core elements of quality of service in the um, uh, telecom licenses with private entities now. And there's an ongoing proposal to create a multi-stakeholder body for this. Uh, and TRA needs to make those recommendations to the DOT. Now, even though we have the guarantee, how it is actualized will be through this body. And I think uh, there's a greater need to pick up space in its creation. And and finally, with regard to internet shutdowns, which was an earlier part of our conversation, the Supreme Court uh, in the Anuradha Basin judgment had indicated certain core parts of the telecom suspension rules require review. And in the last session of Parliament, the Honorable Minister of State for Telecom also gave assurance on the floor of the House that they would be looking at it again. So I think there's another opportunity there in terms of regulatory reform from the government by itself. I think these three solutions by itself, in addition to growth of network capacity, bringing 100% of Indians on, are great solutions to think and aspire towards. So uh, that is, that unfortunately I think it's going to be the end of this discussion at this point. Uh, it's been, I think, very useful. We've heard very strong arguments on why the internet is an essential thing right now. It shouldn't be viewed as a luxury. It is something which we have to start considering elevating it to the status of a right if we want to really uh, ensure access to justice, not just in the times of a pandemic, but otherwise as well. In this time of a pandemic, obviously, the, the importance has been emphasized. And these are things which are going to continue going forward as well. Uh, I think we've had uh, some discussions of the way solutions have to go forward. There's got to be uh, attempts to ensure that our courts are able to handle this and can keep doing this, uh, whether even on a normal basis, because that will actually increase access to justice, even on just a regular basis for people. Uh, we've seen uh, discussions about how uh, that needs to that needs to be uh, measures taken, whether it's with the TRI. Uh, I think a power point and net neutrality, very important one, because again, if you have that, if you have shutdowns, as everyone's discussed, you're just making it tougher for people who really need that access to information and access to, uh, to, 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 to the justice system will go away. And that's not something which is helpful, especially in times of a pandemic when you need information even more importantly uh i think um yeah we could have the discussion on some of these issues we, we could have gone on even longer i think we could have had a few fights as well i'm sure on some issues unfortunately we've had no time for that uh, on this as of now thank you uh, to all the panelists for being here and 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 uh, you know in giving us all this insight and, and and sort of i think also reaffirming many things which a lot of people may have thought and kind of now are understanding that you know there are there's a lot more to it and they really should be fighting for these things. So I'm going to just hand over to the end to uh, Artika to just wrap things up. Um, and yeah, I'm done. And sorry for <laughs> going over time.
There are no problems at all. This has been our most engaging discussion. And thank you to all the panelists who made time to have this. Thank you to, to the moderator. And thank you to the audience. I think we've had a most engaged audience for our session so far. We've got over 20 questions waiting to be answered. Uh, just to say that uh, these are, uh, we hope to continue these conversations. So please send us ideas on team at agami.in and do follow Agami on the social handles to know what session for justice in a pandemic is coming up next. Thank you everybody for joining in, goodbye.